So good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a presentation of the future of rural healthcare strategies for success that um, we have been presenting now for a number of years. It's, um, and each year, each month, each, each time we present, it gets updated because what's happened is um, in the last eight years, the last several years, this has become much more relevant than it was even when we started giving this. Um, my name is Eric Schell and I'm gonna be the primary presenter. My colleague, Dan Given will provide color commentary and he'll be part of the presentation as well. Um, so, so with that, um, I wanna start by saying it's a three-part presentation. The first part of the presentation is about where the healthcare industry is going and why it's going there. And to understand the why really helps uh, fuel the need for change. The second part of the presentation is that there's, there's a value in transit in rural uh, health systems that often we overlook. And I wanna make sure that, that folks are understand and be, are clear on what that is. Uh, and then the third part of the presentation is if we know where and why the market is, we know where the market's going and why, and, um, and, and, and we know that, and we think that rural hospitals have, and have value in that new world. The last part of the presentation is how we get there. And so that, that's gonna be an important part of this. Um, you know, obviously the, the moose on the table, as we say here in Maine, is the, the, um, the COVID-19. Uh, and the pandemic and what's that's brought to our healthcare industry in the last um, 12 months. Uh, I do wanna say that, that, that this presentation predated COVID and will post-date COVID. Um, we'd like to think that, that we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel at this point. And, and, and hospitals we're gonna get it, will have to get back to strategy. And I think this presentation is a really important part of understanding strategy. So with that, we're gonna kick this off by, by jumping into you know, kind of this idea of where the market's going and why. And, and, and the best way to do that is a call to action. And, and, and the call to action is really to demonstrate why the payment system that we're living in, this price times sick care volume is equal to net revenue, is, is, is really failing us. Um, the, first, the first look is in insurance in premiums um, presented by the, um, uh, the, the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, from 1999 to 2020. Uh, healthcare premiums are now for a family of four over $21,000. The, the, the importance of this is that the median household income in 2020 was somewhere just north of $60,000. Healthcare premiums have gotten to be 30% of household income, which is un, unsustainable. It truly is unsustainable. And then if we look at the stepwise increase, does anyone think that there's, uh, these are going to slow down at any point? And, and so you know, you know, my concern is, is that, that this world of price times volume, sick care volume is equal to revenue in a supply driven industry, we're gonna to continue to see these stepwide increases as long as we continue to pay for sick care. The concern is, is, is based on the law, basic laws of supply and demand. The basic laws of supply and demand say as price increases, and uh, you're going to have a demand decline, but also you're going to have supply increase. Now, what does that mean? What does, as price increases, you're going to have more supply. And supply is in the form of substitution. And, and, and hold that thought, because we're going to touch on that here in about three slides. But there's a big uh, uh, substitution effect going on right now that, that, that is really, um, you know, could, could take us and, and blindside us. So that, that's kind of where uh, this first call to action, unsustainable amount of, of, of you know, premiums relative to household income, driving up the, the, the price, which leads to increased supply, reduced demand for healthcare. Call to action number one. The second one is, is the growth of the high deductible plans. Uh, years ago, uh, probably before Dan was in the business, uh, the, 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 we used to say that once, once we attach uh, the financial consequences to sick care consumption will solve this healthcare issue. We'll bring costs back down. We'll get everything under control because the, it's those consumers that have, don't have any financial consequences back in the day for sick care consumption. Um, you know, <laughs> well, you know, forty-two percent of small businesses, which are primarily in our rural communities, uh, have some form of high deductible health plan up from 16% just 10 years ago. 
And, and, and so now we do have a financial consequence from sick care or healthcare consumption. And it's, and it's applied to the consumer. And if we go back to the previous slide, have we seen any change or control for, for the cost of healthcare? Not likely. So call to action number three. Call to action number four, declining inpatient volume. Again, we live in this world of price, what we get paid times sick care volume in most cases is revenue to, to, to health systems. We've over the last 10 years, and this is the latest data available, we had somewhere around a 10% decline in inpatient volume. And, 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 and these projections are, this, this rate of decline is projected to continue on out for the next 10 years. And, and when we start looking out beyond, you know, a one or two year projection period, building in a constant decline in inpatient volume due to new technologies, a shift towards outpatient care, uh, you know, the, the um, uh, new, new, new pharmaceuticals that are reducing the demand for, for inpatient admissions, we're, start, we're starting to see this, this volume, um, this at least one side of the volume equation um, kind of dry up and that's on the inpatient side. The next call to action is, is the accelerating growth in technology. And as we you know, are well aware of what's going on here, uh, you know, in the last um, 30 years, there's been a rate of growth of technology that has, has, is just, just mind boggling. Uh, this comes back to this idea that, that you know, back to the first slide, when we talked about substitutive effects, as price goes up, there's more supply. And we have this perfect storm now of the need for more supply driven by supply and demand and this, this accelerating um, growth in technology, which has created substitutive effects. And, and, and we all know where some of those are. Uh, you know, Apple, Apple, um, you know, look, you know I, I heard a futurist speak at a conference uh, a couple of years ago and they talked about Apple uh, that they believe, I, I, you know, the numbers might be a little off here, but the magnitude is there. I believe the numbers were somewhere between the current revenues from healthcare were around 10 to $15 billion. And within eight years, they wanted those numbers to be $130 billion from healthcare revenue. Apple is jumping into it. <laughs> and again, I would suggest because the price, what has gone into this industry is skyrocketing. We've got, we've got Amazon, um, you know, the, the, actually this is old news at this point because just in the last two weeks, Amazon has announced new, uh, new, new primary care um, um, provider offerings first to its workforce. And then just last week uh, they announced that they were in several states, I believe like five states, they were gonna roll this out to the non Amazon workforce. You know, again, in direct competition, uh, to our primary care service offerings within our rural hospitals. Um, so we've got, we've got substitution for our lab services, bread and butter <laughs> services within our rural health systems that create contribution margin, revenue less direct or variable expenses leads to contribution margin. When we have folks like Earlywell offering home, home lab testing, uh, where, where the, the, um, where they actually, the tests are reviewed by physicians at certified labs, all types of different tests are available. And then you could pick these, these test kits up anywhere from Target, so CVS, Humana, um, and, and, and provide these tests at, at home. Then you've got uh, you know, diagnostic uh, you know, you know, technologies that are available for, for 300 bucks uh, at Best Buy, you can buy this, these, these, these uh, diagnostic uh, like handheld devices that can look at your heart, lungs, ears, throat, um, measure body temperature, all information sent to a primary care provider through telehealth platform. I mean, really something else that, that um, and, and folks now that are living in rural communities that have, that there's significant distance, having access to tools like this uh, really you know, eases up the, their cost of, of getting in the car, driving to a physician's office, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles away, waiting in line, you know, essentially spending a day when they could just do this now from home, home monitoring tools. And all of this has led to a report that came out 
um, in, in, in early, early last year by the American Hospital Association based on 2018 volume. And, and, and this is the first time in 35 years outpatient volume at hospitals um, actually declined. And, uh, and, and, and what was interesting is this third bullet down, it's it, what, what they talk about that, that the amount of outpatient care delivered has most likely increased, but where patients are accessing the service is, is, is kind of what's changing. And they're accessing it through those things, the technology and the Amazons and the Tidos and, and, and the types of services. So, so again, now we live in this, this, this price times sick care volumes equal to net revenue. When we had, you know, kind of outpatient volume being affected by the substitutive effects of technology, inpatient volume declining through the substitutive effects of pharmaceuticals and through, um, uh, you know, just, just changes in care patterns. Um, we this this world of fee for service, uh, fee for sick care service is starting to be challenged, and this has all resulted in 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 uh, um, you know, information um, each year. MedPAC puts out um, a study looking at Medicare margins by provider group, and and what we can see here is that that starting around two thousand and thirteen. The, the, the gray line is all hospitals. And so we've seen you know, all hospital Medicare margins drop from negative 5%, dropped all the way down to, to, to negative 10% before a slight uptick in 2018 and 19. Uh, my understanding from reading the MedPAC report is that uptick uh, relates specifically to inpatient coding changes as well as some benefits from the 340B program. The blue line is, is rural hospitals excluding critical access hospitals, and the, and the orange line is, is the rural hospitals including the critical access hospitals. Obviously, the critical access hospitals getting some form of cost-based reimbursement, not necessarily 100% of cost due to sequestration and other things. Um, there are negative margins there, but they're not as bad as the non-critical uh, access hospital rural hospitals. But overall, you know, with declines in inpatient volume, you're starting to see declines in outpatient volume. And, and for one, the, you know, as part of the Affordable Care Act years ago, the, 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 the Affordable Care Act had a, um, I believe it was a 10 year provision where the price updates that they would give um, to on, on inpatient DRGs and outpatient APCs had a factor that said, we're gonna give you market basket update inflation and then we're going to subtract off a half a percent increasing to 0.75%. And that stayed in effect for, I believe it was 10 years. And what happened is with the decline in outpatient, uh, you know, inpatient and outpatient volume, and, 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 and now your the, the largest payer, Medicare, for those hospitals paid on a fee-for-service basis, um, receiving uh, on the price side inflation less 0.75%, that accumulated and over time started to take its toll on, on our rural hospitals. And, and, and again, so this world of price times volume is net revenue when price relative to cost from a major payer, Medicare, uh, is it, when, when, price is, uh, when price is less than inflation and, 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 and volume is starting to come out, it's no wonder we're, we're seeing some of these declines in, in Medicare margins. Resulting in, and this was uh, updated as of uh, the end of February, we had 136 rural hospitals happen to close over that time frame. Uh, again, building the case for this call to action of why we have to start thinking about something different. Um, back uh, back uh, uh, a year and a half ago, uh, Seema Verma, who was um, the prior administration's um, director of, 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 of CMS, um, she was presenting and, 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 um, at an American Hospital Association regional meeting. And some of her quotes are something we really have to take to heart here. She said, so, so make no mistake, if your business model is focused merely on increasing volume rather than improving health outcomes, coordinating care and cutting waste, you will not succeed under the new paradigm. 
Uh, her second quote that we've circled here, and in, in all of these quotes are important, but the second one is we must move past the status quo, past fee-for-service payments to a system in which we're paying providers to keep people healthy, reduce costs, and deliver better outcome. I mean, what we're talking about is a shift in the payment system. And this is mirrored in the, the MedPAC report that came out in June of last year, and, and frankly was echoed in the March 15th, 2021 report that just came out a week ago, that um, where, where ultimately the MedPAC is advising Congress by, by saying, we have to move to a new payment system. And right now the payment systems that, that we have to leverage are the accountable care organizations, which challenges uh, you know, um, and the, the Medicare Advantage programs and creating bonuses around reducing cost here. And they saw these as the two vehicles for bringing down the cost of future healthcare. Again, changing the payment system. So, you know, if one would say, well, hey, the, the Obama administration came out with the accountable care organizations with the Affordable Care Act. The Trump administration, um, we didn't know at the time when in 2016 where that direction was going to go. They got on completely on board with the, you know, the 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 the, the need, the imperative to transition payment. Um, and now MedPAC continuing with that effort, um, I would, you know, one would expect that that the current administration is going to pick up and move with this as well. So a need to change the payment system. So some of the final thoughts around here, um, you know, in terms of where the market's going and why, is that traditional fee for service is going to condition, continue to transition to value-based payment. Um, organizations, as, as payment systems evolve, are going to have to seek out operational efficiencies. And, 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 and these are going to have to continue to accelerate as more substitutive effects of technology reduce the, the, the you know, half of that price times volume equation. And, 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 and you know, payment rates not meeting with inflationary impacts. Clinical integration is going to be necessary and, and flexibility is, is going to have to be maintained because we don't necessarily know when the payment, that tipping point of the payment system, you know, to a true population-based payment system is going to happen. And so anything that we do in terms of strategy for rural health systems is going to have to be flexible enough to know that, that um, it, 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 it's probably not going to be next year, the tipping point of payment. Um, but, you know, over the next several years, it's, it's ultimately going, you know, we believe it's going to happen. Uh, Dan and I um, recently did a, a, a project um, for a, a client in the upper Midwest, and, and we actually, it, it was labeled um, Rural Healthcare 2030, where, where we, we set 2030 as the date for a transition in payment system. So Dan, any comments regarding the, 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 um, this, this where the market's going and why? No, I think you really hit on the points there. I mean, you and I both, um, just within our own health plan, we get actually paid to call our health plan before we seek care so they can find the most cost efficient place. Um, and you and I both, I think, and some of our colleagues have used uh, telehealth on our phone for our doctors. And so we're not even, even as people who are really involved in rural health care have used substitutions uh, quite frequently. So I, I think it's a direction that the market's going to continue to go towards. Yeah. yeah and, and again, this is basic laws of, mm. of supply and demand. Uh, and again. We, and we also saw with the pre, uh, Trump administration uh, pushing price transparency, which was designed, at least uh, ideally, it was designed to you know, help the consumer shop for services. So um, it's going to be uh, really crucial for rural health systems to make sure that they keep that in mind. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. So, so let's talk about what this future looks like. Um, you know, we think that, that the competitive driver in the future is going to be patient value. Um, patient value is an equation that says quality over cost times population uh, is what patient value is. And the goal here is to either improve quality, keeping costs constant, reduce costs, keeping quality constant, and then apply that equation to a larger population as a form of increasing patient value. The goal would be to increase quality, reduce costs and applying it to larger population. And that's the true you know, kind of competitive driver of the future. Uh, so, so with that said, 
you know, and, and we've talked a lot about payment systems is, 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 is we, we want to define accountable care as a payment system, not necessarily ACO as we know it, but an accountable care, little a, little c, as a payment system. And it's a payment system where providers monetize the value derived from increasing quality, reducing cost. And let me say that again, because that's a it sounds like MBA jargon. It's a payment system where providers financially benefit from the value derived from increasing quality, reducing cost, and then applying that to a population. So, so, so what does that look like? Well, that could look like anything from bundled payments, um, value-based payment program, uh, provider self-insured health plans. Many of our rural health systems have their own self-insured health plan. The extent we re improve our quality of our health plan, uh, reducing the cost and, and applying it to a larger set of our population, then, then we've actually, you know, kind of increased quality, reduced costs and applied to a population. We've monetized some of that value. Uh, Medicare defined ACOs, and then ultimately capitated provider sponsored healthcare. If we think about that, we, we go right to Kaiser, what Kaiser is doing. They are a capitated provider sponsored health system. If they, and, and, and frankly, if you look at their track record, you know, when they're reporting, you know, billion dollar pro quarterly profits, um, they've figured this out, how to you know, aggregate population, reduce cost, increase quality, and monetize that benefit. And it's different. This, this little a, little c payment system, accountable care, um, it's different than, in, than, than what we used to think of as managed care. You know, back in the day, um, you know, managed care, um, first of all, if we think about who monetized the value of increasing quality, reducing cost, it wasn't the provider organizations, it was the insurance organizations. And, 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 and frankly, they had very little impact on quality and cost. It's the provider organizations that have the greatest ability to in, influence quality and cost, and they didn't have the incentives. And so you know, now with these accountable care provide, uh, uh, payment systems where providers monetize the value, we've got the incentives right this time, number one. The second one, the, in the managed care era, all of this, 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 this gatekeeper and PMPMs and all of this was all done for the commercial side of business, which in many of our rural communities, 15 to 30% of our business. Medicare sat on the sideline and Medicaid sat on the sidelines here. Now we've got the, you know, your, your major payer, Medicare uh, and, and Medicaid, all saying we're on board with this and we're going to be driving this bus. So government's all in. We've got new information systems to manage quality and cost. Uh, we've got new ways of looking at utilization at a real-time basis. Back in the day, I was involved in an IPA, Individual Practices Association, as a director of finance. Um, and, and we used to, and, and we had a ca capitated arrangement um, for 400,000 covered lives. Um, and, and, and we were looking at claims amounts six months after the fact. It's very tough to manage, um, you know, kind of cost of care when you're looking at claims utilization for six months past the date that they were actually delivered. Um, we've got a science now. Um, we can hold our industry, we can hold our provider organizations accountable for performance relative to industry standards. So we've got science backing us. And finally, going back is not an option. And, 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 I, and I put that out there going back to slide two, where the cut when the, again, the cost, we've gotten to be 30% of household income. And, and we're at a point where we're not sustainable and we're allowing substitution to take hold. And as that takes hold by well-capitalized for-profit organizations, um, you know, this, this, is, this is a group that is not to be fooled with. At, you know, ask, um, um, oh gosh, uh, Dan, what was the, uh, uh, the, the CD company? Um, oh gosh, not Netflix. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, you know, the companies that literally were driven out of business, uh, the whole entire industry is driven out of business um, um, because of these companies. So again, you know, it's different this time. Accountable care it, payment is a payment system where providers monetize the value and it's not looking like it's going to go back. So, so here's where we really talk about where rural hospitals have significant value. Um, and, and, um, 
it came out of this, the, the ACO relationship to small rural hospitals. Back when the original regs on the ACOs came out, I believe it was uh, early 2012 or late 2011, I, I remember reading these regs and, and there was a statement in the regs that just jumped right out at me. And I said, my gosh, this is the value of rural health hospitals in, in the future. And, and, and the statement said something like this. It said, specialists and hospitals can belong to multiple accountable care organizations. Primary care physicians can belong to one accountable care organization. And now you're probably thinking, why did that one line, you know, kind of strike Eric as being something interesting and showed the value of rural hospitals? And, and, and here's why, you know, kind of, if you think about, you know, kind of, you know, general business today, uh, you've got cost centers and revenue centers. Uh, cost centers, you essentially can spread around and you can allocate costs. Revenue centers, you can really only attribute it, uh, you know, to one, you know, revenue comes in and you have to attribute it once. What this one statement, and again, the statement said, a primary care physician can belong to one ACO, hospitalists and specialists can belong to multiple ACOs. What that said about the future is that primary care providers are revenue centers. If you're not a revenue center, you're a cost center. And cost centers literally overnight will become the bricks and mortar of hospitals, the technologies and the specialists. Uh, whereas the revenue centers of this world become the primary care physicians. And so why is that important to rural? Well, rural hospitals are based, primarily based on a primary care delivery infrastructure. They, rural hospitals that are, have strong linkages to their primary care base have extreme value in this new world relative to their cost. And so rural hospitals that are, are strongly aligned with their primary care have, have, have become very efficient and demonstrate high quality are the highest value health systems in the future. And, and the next slide really builds on this case. And, and because what it does is I'm gonna compare and contrast, uh, you know, kind of the fee for sick care payment system versus the, the um, you know, kind of a population based payment system, an ACO, a payment system where payment is tied to a population. For example, uh, you know, you know, Dan and I are each worth $10,000 in a population-based payment system. The goal is to aggregate lots and lots of Dan and Eric's in, into your panel of, of, of patients that you're taking care of, or actually uh, yeah, yeah, people that you're taking care of so that you can aggregate payment. And, it's, and, and, and so let's compare and contrast a fee for sick care payment system with a population-based payment system or an accountable care payment system that we talked about earlier. So, so first, if, you, if we just look at, it, at this, this, um, um, this axis here, we've got volumes on the x-axis, we've got dollars on the, the, the y-axis. And, and, and you know, for rural hospitals or health systems, we've got all our costs at zero volume. We have to maintain a certain amount of, of, of uh, capacity, even at zero volume. So our costs start out very high, and then every incremental unit of service that, is, that, that we can generate, our variable costs go up a tiny bit. bit. So think of an inpatient in, um, admitted to a hospital today. Uh, you know, the, our, our variable costs you know, went up with food and pharmaceuticals and things like that, but not a whole lot. But our revenue, on the other hand, the orange line, the revenue goes up much higher. We get you know, $2,000 for that inpatient admission. And so ultimately in the fee for sick care payment system, as long as you can push out volume far enough, the steep slope curve of revenue is going to catch the shallow slope curve of cost. And so the goal within the fee for sick care payment system is, is to push out volume which that's what we're, we're continuing to do. And again, we're, uh, you know, we, we, the industry is well noted as being a supply driven industry, pushing out volume and increasing the slope of the payment line. And, and you know, kind of think about the, 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 the ways to increase the slope of the payment line. And, and one of the best ones, and I'll give you an example, is, is, is uh, cardiothoracic surgery or, or neurosurgery or even orthopedic surgery where, every service that we provide, the per unit revenue goes up significantly, meaning the slope of this 
orange curve moves to the left. And now when we think about that world of, of fee for sick care, and we compare and contrast rural hospitals and urban hospitals, who do you think benefited from a world in which pushing out volume and increasing the slope of the revenue line um, resulted in increased financial performance? And the answer is clear, it's, it's the urban hospitals. Now turn this around and talk about and compare and contrast a population-based payment system. Our costs all remain the same, although one would argue that our costs in, in you know, this line significantly increased because as we talked about, if you're not a revenue, you're an expense. So bricks and mortar technology and hospitals just became part of this cost line. The revenue line, on the other hand, how do we increase our revenue? And ultimately, volume is in the form of people, of Dan's and Eric's. How do we get more people? Well, in most cases, people are attached to primary care physicians. For example, a busy primary care practice may have 2,000 patients in their active panel. At healthcare costs uh, a, a year ago of about $10,000 per person, a busy primary care practice with 2,000 patients in their panel is, is, is worth about not 2 million, $20 million. A rural hospital that has say five primary care practices or physicians aligned with that hospital has a value of $100 million, a future economic value in a population-based payment world of $100 million for probably direct costs of 40 million. And so when we start looking at our rural hospitals and our rural health systems, and we see where's the value in the future. I, I promise you the rural hospitals who are strongly aligned with their primary care, the revenue centers of the new world have much higher value than the urban hospitals that with the fixed costs of, 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 of the technology, the bricks and mortar and the specialists that are now uh, overnight have become cost centers. So really important to understand that, that difference and that compare and contrast. So, so in terms of you know, this future, this world, rural hospitals have significant, in, in our opinion, rural hospitals have significant value in this new world to the extent they understand that. Um, they have lower, often lower per beneficiary costs. Uh, we're the revenue centers of the future. And frankly, a lot of the critical access hospitals that we work with, they're essentially budget-based systems, right? Because if you're not a revenue center, you're an expense center, often the payment form of an expense center in today's just business 101 is we give them budgets and we hold them to the budget. Think of housekeeping. We give housekeeping a budget. Um, we'll flex that budget if, for example, we've added two new MOBs. We'll flex that budget to allow variable costs but essentially it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, a budget with a variable cost add-on. Well, that's frankly cost-based reimbursement almost. And um, so, 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 you know, I, I think rural hospitals have significant value in this new world. So that's part of, we have already talked about where and why the industry is going, uh, where it's going and why it's going. We talked about some of the value of rural uh, health systems in that world. Let's figure out how to get there. Again, the most uh, tacky slide in the industry at this point, it's, it's the shaky bridge. And um, many of you have probably heard about this, this uh, analogy between the transition in payment to, this, to, to being out on a shaky bridge. And let me explain a little bit because there's a lot of really important pieces to this. Uh, the first is that in 2014, I'm, we're gonna stand, start over here at the fee for sick care payment system. And it was a great payment system for as many years as we can go back. And it was a great payment system because it was a per the delivery system and the payment system is perfectly aligned. And because the more sick care that we do, the, you know, so, so the more sick care they do, we better, the better off we do financially. So everyone had incentives to push up the, 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 the you know, the, the, the demand or the, 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 the utilization of sick care to generate margin or profit within our healthcare systems. And that was a great pillar until price started getting to the point where we've enabled substitution, where we're starting to see volume declines and third party payers are not willing to play inflationary increases, meaning price relative to cost is going down. And all of a sudden price times volume is net revenue is a pillar that's starting to smolder. 
Over here on the right, we have got a population-based payment system. In here, you know, every pop, every peop, uh, person has a value at this point of around ten thousand dollars, and and over here we've got a payment system where we want to accumulate lives and then reduce the cost of sick care by investing in health care. Over here we have a stable platform. The more sick, the less sick care you do, the more health care you do, the better you do financially. And frankly, this aligns with where our communities and our people really would like us to be. So there's a third benefit there. But the problem is, is, is uh, you know, we have a perfectly aligned payment system in 2030. We've got a perfectly aligned payment system in 2014 that's smoldering. But to get from here to there is a challenge. The first is because we don't have a healthcare system. We have a sick care system. We've spent 50 years developing the best healthcare or sick care system in the, in, in the world. Um, and, 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 but, but now we've got to create a, health, a true healthcare system where we're interested in the health of our community. That's going to take time. We can't do that overnight. The second is, is, is you've got a lot of payment that, that it's, it's going to take time for the third party payers to kind of reduce the influence of sick care and increase payment for health care. And so everything in between here, you got schizophrenia where you're going to your doctors and you're going to your doctors and saying, hey, for Medicare, we're in an ACO, a population-based payment system. We want you to manage the care, bring down utilization. For Blue Cross, we're in fee for sick care. We want you to increase your utilization. Schizophrenia, your doctors are gonna look at you and say, please leave my office. I, I, I don't really have time for this conversation, appropriately so. And so what we have to do, you know, and, and one thing, I just want to build up the, this, this payment because uh, several years ago, Dr. Raj Kumar, who was the CMMI interim director, he actually defined what the payment system would look like as we transition across that shaky bridge. The first was, you know, this is the 2014, you know, the far left that was stable until it started to smolder with declines in price relative to cost. And, and defines in, 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 in volume, sick care volume. So this was category one, fee for service with no links to quality and utilization. Category two, in which most of us are on right now, is we're still primarily paid on fee for service, but now we have links to quality and, and value. We have links, we have the merit incentive payment system for physicians that have that tie in quality. We have uh, you know, insurance companies um, um, you know, offering incentives for reduced ER utilization. Um, so this, this, if we go back, this is kind of over here, you know, right where we are you know, kind of today. Um, feet are still above the crocodile somewhat. So we're feeling a little safe. We still connected to this, this pillar on the left a little bit. Then we go out to this pillar here, category three, alternative payment models built on a fee for service architecture. Uh, this is danger land. This is feet right above the crocodiles because everything that we do to create health in our community bodes negatively for our CFOs and our CEOs that are trying to lead a financially sound hospital. And board members are not very happy with hospital leadership because again, you know, everything we do to create health shows up poorly when the, the, the primary fee for service architecture is an accounting system that measures um, you know, kind of financial health based on sick care charges and contractual allowances. And so this is a tough world. And this is the one, again, feet right above the crocodiles. Uh, the, the, the next one is, is we're merging out the other side where you have a population-based payment built on a population-based infrastructure. This is, you know, to some degree, there's one system in the United States that's gotten there and it's Kaiser. Uh, and, and they're reaping the rewards of that. Other systems are still struggling. I, I just, um, uh, just last week in, in um, modern healthcare, uh, uh, anyway, it was uh, healthcare literature. I read about UPMC, which is a large, you know, you know, you know over a million covered lives in their health plan. They have, you know, I don't know, 30 uh, hospitals in their system. And literally the article was saying that the insurance company division of UPMC was doing great, but the hospital division was not doing so great because of underutilization. And if you think about that, is that the way to think about this? Um, I, I, you know, that, that, that your hospitals, because the, the, the overall company is doing okay, the insurance is doing well because the hospital utilization is low, 
but the hospital's utilization is low and they're underperforming. Um, Kaiser says, we're successful when all our hospitals are empty. And they've, they've figured this thing out. So, so anyway, this is, you know, this is the world where the payment starts to get over here and you're getting away from the crocodiles. The problem is, is to go from you know, the straight fee for service, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And what we have to do within rural hospitals, we have to create an approach to get there. I'm going to show you that in a minute. The last thing I want to just get at, and this is really important because you know, Dan and I are both accountants by background. And so we've been talking a lot about payment system. And, and why is it that the payment system is so important? And, and I think this slide captures that. And, and it captures this premise. The premise is that we, the form that we create is built around, is built to address the functional imperatives of the payment system that exists. All right, so let's, let's take a look at that. We're in this fee for sick care payment system. The, the, the functional imperatives, what we have to do to be successful, there's three things that we have to do. And we can do them in isolation. If we manage our, our own price, what we get paid, our own utilization, how much, how much sick care volume we can create, and we can manage our costs. We can do that in isolation and, and, and be successful. Those are the functional imperatives. And so the form that evolves out of this fee-for-service payment system is independent organizations competing with other independent organizations for market share, right? That's, and, 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 and so to some degree, I heard a presentation several years ago at a Mississippi Hospital Association conference where they had a presenter um, talk about that how the fee-for-service payment is a disaggregating payment where the new world is more of an aggregating payment system. And this is, he's hitting on this concept right here. So now if we look at the, the po population-based payment system, the functional imperatives change significantly here. They, they flip right upside down. I mean, the first of all, in order to offer an entire population to both health and, and sick care, we can't do that in isolation. A hospital can't be a hospitalation. A hospital has to be aligned with a medical staff. That combined hospital and medical staff has to have access to tertiary care, has to have access to public health, uh, post-acute care, uh, transportation. All of these pieces become part of a system of true health care that, that is, going, is responsible for the health and sick of, of an entire population. So we got to aggregate. The second thing is, is you know, to take on the residual claim of health. And I wanna be very specific here. I didn't say to take on risk because we all talk about risk. I look at risk as a fee, as a fee for service relic. I look at it as, as when we start really getting into this thing, the residual claim on health. If we get paid, if, 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 if the health system gets paid $10,000 for Dan and Eric and the health system can offer health care and sick care for $8,000, the residual claim on health is $2,000. And, and, and frankly, that's how I'd really like us to start thinking about this. But, but, but ultimately, if we're gonna take that residual claim on health, we've gotta aggregate lives to diversify <laughs> and make sure that we have enough people with adverse, you know, some healthy, some sick, to be able to you know, kind of uh, you know, take on that residual claim of health. And so what the form that's evolving is aligned organizations competing with other aligned organizations for covered lives based on quality and value back to that patient value equation. And, and so, you know, when we start talking about the payment system, it's important because again, the, we organized ourselves around the functional imperatives of the payment system that exists. When a payment system in the midst of flipping upside down with functional imperatives changing, we have to start thinking about that and taking that into account when we're looking out at a longer term strategic plan for our rural health systems. So Eric, how does an organization, I think this is something that a lot of people wonder, is if you're an independent uh, rural health system, you know, you have primary care, maybe you're a critical access hospital and you have some visiting specialists, how do you, how are you able to get the covered lives if you're just a small organization? Does that mean you have to align with a larger system? What, what are your options? Dan, I think that's going to, the, the next slide will touch on some of that, right. but, but I don't think we have to align today, but I do think in the, form, in, in the future, you know, by, by 2030 for sure, that we will have to commit to some form of, of, of alignment 
to be able to aggregate those dollars under one umbrella. Um, and, 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 um, but again, I, I think the alignment models of today built around a payment system that doesn't necessarily require them will be very different than alignment models of the future. All right. Especially when the rural hospitals have significant value they bring to the equation. So good, good question. And I think we're going to hit on that next. So, so we're going to spend a few minutes on this slide because, uh, you know, we developed, Stratwater developed this. It's called the transition framework. Um, several years ago, working with four critical access hospitals in Northern New Hampshire. And it was, it was, it, it was a, a means of, of moving them from the fee-for-service payment system to a population-based payment system while keeping kind of the sick care system intact and optimized, creating a healthcare system and transforming payments so that they all stayed in lockstep. And, and so the, you know, here, let, me, let me explain this to you and, and we'll, we'll take three minutes here to do that. Going across the X axis is the payment, right? Because payment establishes the functional imperatives. And, and so we've got fee for service on the left. This is the column that's no longer exists that smoldering people have stepped off it. This is phase one payment. This is, this is, uh, this is that, that fee for service, primarily fee for service, but tie-ins to quality and utilization so that your feet are still above the crocodiles. Phase two is, is this, this is the feet right above the crocodiles. These are alternative payment models built on a fee for service architecture. Uh, phase three going across the X axis is where we start to come out and we create population based infrastructure uh, to support a population based payment system. And then the last area is where um, is, is ultimately a provider based health plan. It's Kaiser's, it's UPMC's, it's Presbyterian Healthcare in, in, in um, um, uh, New Mexico, where you have sick care, health care, and payment under one umbrella. So, so what we have is think of this as time, and maybe this is 2030, and maybe this is 2000, this is today, phase one is today. Um, and again, we, we don't necessarily know when it's coming. We believe it's coming. We just don't know when. So the way this is laid out, there's three strategic areas to be addressed. The first is the, we, we've got to transform our sick care system. And this is these three rows, these three initiatives that transform sick care. And it's, it is we, we, the strategic bucket of delivery system. The second is, and we've got the blue bar here in the middle, is we have to create a healthcare system. But we have to be careful that we don't create it too quickly because if we get everybody healthy right today and we're still paid primarily under the fee for service with tie-ins to quality and utilization, we're gonna bankrupt our organizations. And then the last is we have to proactively, strategically transform payment. And, and so what we did is we laid out, we laid out seven kind of initiatives that really rural health systems should be thinking about as they develop strategic plans. The, the orange bar that comes down, this is the strike point. When the initiative hits the orange bar, it's an implementation. We have to implement. Um, and, um, down here, we've got an orange bar coming up at a 45 degree angle or, <laughs> or something close. Um, when the initiative hits this, we have to strike. Up until that point, we can plan for strike. So let, let's just kind of quickly go through these so you can get a sense for what we're talking about. We're going to transform our sick care system. The first is we've got to improve our operation, operating efficiencies, quality, patient engagement. We have to do that today. Um, we've got 136 rural hospitals that have, have closed. They haven't figured out the payment systems moved and they haven't, they haven't embraced this. Uh, the next is they have to align with their primary care providers by the time the payment system gets to phase two, alternative payment models built on a fee-for-service infrastructure. Why is that? Is because your primary care providers in that world are your revenue centers. So today, we're in phase one, we're in today, we've got to create a plan to fully align with your primary care providers. Uh, the next initiative down to transform our sick care system is coming together in larger systems of care uh, to take out big chunks of fixed costs, to ultimately reduce the cost of sick care so that we can take some of those resources and invest them in the blue bar, in healthcare. And so today we create a strategy 
in the future, we create an implementation plan. And then somewhere out closer to 2030, we start to strike on this. We have to strike on this, meaning we come together. So Dan, to your earlier question, when you said, you know, you know, do we, you know, can we remain independent? I would say we could remain independent. We can start to talk about a strategy today. We can do an implementation plan, but ultimately in the future, we've got to aggregate the population. We've got to aggregate resources to be able to make this happen. So here's how we're gonna transform sick care. We've got to create healthcare. Think of this as crawl in phase one, walk in phase two, uh, run, and then sprint. And so some of the things that we can do today, you know, create our patient-centered medical homes or like models, right? Invest in, in that infrastructure so that when we get to column two, we can get through it more quickly. Care, develop care management, data analytics, um, um, evidence-based protocols. You know, all of these are opportunities to develop infrastructure, but not necessarily striking, <laughs> um, you know, to the point where we're dacing sick care utilization. When we get out here in phase two, payer networking contracting, um, value attribution, you know, when we create financial improvement from reducing sick care utilization, how do we get that value? How's that value accredited to us? And then it, it, this advances out. How do we, what about payment? Well, today, the strike point today is, is we wanna make sure that we don't do anything that takes out sick care that hurts us financially. So where do, what do we have? Well, we have a self-funded health insurance plan. And um, what are we doing around redesigning the benefit package to create health within our own employees? Thinking of our own employees as a at-risk population. Um, what about getting paid for fee-for-service quality and utilization, the, the merit incentive payment system for physicians, um, annual wellness visits are an opportunity to get paid for health. These are all things that we can get paid for health. As we move up, transitional payment models. Think of this as low risk or no risk um, models where we take on a population. For example, uh, um, you know, ACOs. Um, up until just you know just recently, ACOs you could get into risk free. Now there's 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 a little bit of risk that we got to take it take, but you know it's it's one of these you know you know kind of start to think about the planning for that and then strike in the future. The last is the full risk cap, the full risk plans. Again, your your Kaiser where their the revenue is premium dollar and 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 they take that premium dollar and invest it in sick care and healthcare resources. Strategy, this is aligned primarily with initiative three, where you have a strategy, you have an implementation plan, you know, full risk plan, strategy, implementation plan, and strike point. In the end, what this transition framework does is it takes sick care, health care, and payment and folds it under the umbrella of a provider-based um, health plan. Um, the, the, one of the key pieces of this is that there's two real key functions of this transition framework. First, it takes this nebulous concept of population health and parses it up into bit size, essentially ta uh, tactics that you can, we can implement. The second thing is, is it makes sure it keeps aligned the transition of sick care, the creation of healthcare and payment so that one doesn't get in front of the other one, which creates a significant jeopardy for organizations. Um, so the transition framework is, is something that we've been using um, to help hospitals think through this transition. It allows flexibility, as we had talked about the importance of flexibility, because we don't necessarily know when the payment's gonna get here. In other words, if we can implement, as, as long as we haven't implemented, we can always go back. So it's a series of strikes and options. At the orange bar is strikes. Up until the strike, it's an option. So it allows us to, to kind of you know, remain flexibility as we go forward with this notion. So let me just get into, in the next uh, 10 minutes, just talk about this and then we're gonna wrap up. First initiative one, and you can see over here in the top right, um, you, you, you can see that, that we've circled this. You know, what does operating efficiencies, patient safety quality mean? Well, hospitals that are not operating efficiently at the top of their game are going to are, are going to struggle here as the payment system starts to evolve. Um, you know, appropriate patient volumes meeting needs of the service area. Most rural hospitals, if we think about this, when 60 or 65 percent of our business is driving right by our front door, if we are able to recapture five percent more of that market share, it's a 15 percent increase in volume, which significantly reduces fixed cost per unit of service and increases our efficiency. Revenue cycles, operating with best practice. We've got to be at 45 days in AR and it has to be good. 
expenses managed aggressively, physician practices managed effectively. All of these are, are signs of efficient hospitals. We have to be able to compete with everybody on our quality. Here's an example of a, of a, of a critical access hospital in Western Massachusetts. The green, this is your HCAP scores. The green is they are the highest in the region, the best score in the region. This one hospital beat every other competitor um, on, qual on HCAP scores. And, and the funny thing about them, they're, they're, the, the, the main hospital uh, structure was probably built in the 1940s. And, and, and they were still able to be able to compete with everybody on quality. An absolute imperative of this first uh, row, this strike point of, of improving operating efficiencies, focus on quality. The second is we move down to the second initiative is, is primary care alignment. Again, the most important thing, one of the most important things we can leave as part of this presentation is the value of a primary care provider in the new world of payment. And, 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 and the attributed lives and the revenue centers. And, and what we like to think about is, 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 is the opportunity for rural hospitals is using Stephen Covey's models of dependency. You have dependent, your, 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 your five-year-old, independent, your 18-year-old, and interdependent, your 26-year-old. We have to think of all of our medical staff and our primary care providers as fundamentally independent. Uh, they have options. And if we can think of them as independent first, it's seeking a higher level of relationship, interdependent. We can apply this three-legged stool of contractual alignment, functional alignment, and governance alignment. And if we can check the boxes on all of our primary care providers around contractual alignment, functional alignment, and governance alignment, we've got a home run. Um, often in, where in communities, in rural communities, where there's... there's um, um, independent primary cares, there's often an opportunity to recreate a PHO or a clinically integrated network to draw them in functionally, contractually, and gov through governance. This is the third row down. This is the one, you know, that Dan had mentioned earlier around, you know, what do we look like in the future? Um, what I'd like to say is that, you know, over time, as we develop these relationships with evolving or, you know, of, of evolving systems, I'd like to think that there's that interdependent model of alignment where we focus on governance function and contracts as a form of alignment rather than giving away the soul of our rural hospital. And, and I think that, and as I mentioned early on in this presentation, the, 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 the affiliation models of today um, that were essentially you know, to, you know, to, to address the functional imperatives of a sick care payment, a fee-for-service payment system are going to evolve and be very different as, as the new payment systems evolve. And I'd like to think that there's more benefit for rural hospitals in that. So, so that's the big piece of there. So we're going to transform our sick care system. Uh, we're going to transform payment. And, and we talked a little bit about this. You know, this, our own self-funded health employer plan. Hospitals are already at 100% at risk for this employee population. Um, we've got to create you know, better consumerism, um, you, you create um, uh, penalties for risky behavior within our plan design, um, enroll our own employee populations with health coaches and chronic disease programs, uh, you know, all opportunities around our self-funded health plan. Uh, the fee-for-service, we talked about this, um, quality and utilization incentives, um, maximize fee-for-service, um, um, wellness visits, chronic care management, transitional care management, maximize MIPS um, incentive payments, the MIPS ACO incentive payments. All of these are opportunities to get paid for um, health-related activities. I had a hospital we worked with in Ohio uh, several years ago, and when they actually quantified the impact of all of the payment they were getting for health-related activities, it was over a million dollars. And um, this was a larger, a sole community provider, but they realized that they could take that million dollars and invest it in that blue bar in the middle. Um, initiatives two and three, this is, gets into this, the, you know, primarily row two, where we start looking at the fee-for-service and moving into ACOs, accountable care organizations, and taking on some of that, again, residual claim on health from our patient population. And, and um, um, often, often you, you can, once we have the ACOs up and running, there's often, you know, kind of direct contracting with employers once we learn how to care for the patients. Um, as well as commercial uh, insurance opportunities around, you know, uh, kind of, you know, gain sharing opportunities. Um, and then the blue bar in the middle. And in first phase, I mean, again, the key is a crawl here. Develop the infrastructure, 
PCMA, primary care medical home infrastructure, team-based care as a means of leveraging your primary care providers, uh, care management, um, you know, kind of discharge planning, transitions of care, develop claims analysis capabilities. You know, for example, if you're in an ACO and you have access to the claims, what an incredible way to shine light on where, where your entire population is getting access to, to healthcare and sick care services. And, and boy, if, if they're leaving the community for things that you can be providing, bringing those back into your hospital is going to bode very well financially, um, even in the ACO. And Eric, I think one of the interesting things just talking about claims um, analysis was you were worked or went to a hospital where the CEO actually analyzed his, you know, high flyers or frequent flyers of his emergency room and inpatient services so he could focus on reducing the cost of care for those particular Medicare beneficiaries in his ACO. And then also um, from just the Pennsylvania global budget model, uh, some of the analysis of those hospitals found that I forget the exact percentage of potentially avoidable utilization of their emergency rooms, but it was greater than 50 percent. Significant. Um, it was really significant. So when you can start to apply uh, some of the data analytics to really pick out uh, those areas of opportunities to try to actually improve health care and uh, prevent the sick care from happening, uh, some, there's real dollars too that can be attached to that. Absolutely. Uh, it, it, as Dan was talking about, a friend of mine was a CEO of a rural hospital up in the upper Midwest. And every morning he would, he had an analyst outside his office and he would sit down with the analysts and they would sit down and look at claims. Uh, they, at one point they looked at, 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 you know, they wanted to look at the largest Medicare claim the prior year. It was probably 213,000 or 16,000. I don't remember the exact numbers of which 170 of that, 170,000 of that claim was from a swing bed stay in a community 30 miles down the street. I promise you, if you knew the CEO, that will not happen again. <laughs> that swing bed patient will stay at his hospital. So, you know, so lots of opportunity there as we start to move out. And again, we gotta be careful. We don't do this too fast, but, um, you know, develop, um, you know, payment system. That's the big one, the attribute value where savings are created. No free riders here. If you create the value with an ACO, we ought to be able to figure out a funds flow model where we benefit from that. And um, um, anyway, the transition framework, as I mentioned before, we believe this is a really important um, vehicle for, for us to kind of, un, you know, kind of take away the mystique of this movement to quote population health. And, and it's in the form of transitioning sick care, creating health care, and transitioning payment, proactively transitioning payment, um, you, know, you know, kind of in tone with this. Um, you know, being somewhat, um, you know, an accountant, both, again, Dan and I are both accountants, and being risk adverse, we believe this is an approach where it's a series of options and strikes, um, it, you know, to reduce risk. It's in the right direction. It, it, um, it, takes this concept and, and breaks it into bite-sized pieces where leadership within our rural health systems can start to implement this. And again, it, it, you know, back to this, if we get out here and the payment system for whatever reason backs up, as long as we haven't gone forward with the strike, we can always back up. And so, you know, kind of the concluding comments is that, you know, for decades, rural hospitals, um, you know, in this fee for sick care payment world, and, and you know, de dealing with low, low volumes and declining populations and the challenge of provider recruitment, you know, all of these challenges that were driven by this fee for sick care payment system, um, you know, you know we've had all of these challenges. Um, you know, ultimately in the future that, that, that healthcare delivered in these local communities by us has high value. Um, and, and primarily with our rural hospital tie-in to the primary care base, you know, as the payment system emerges, that, that, that connection is going to have high value. We got to cross this shaky bridge and we got to start on that now. Anyone looking at a three a year planning process uh, or time frame, when, you know, possibly within, you know, you, we're halfway through a payment system that's fundamentally going to pick up and turn upside down the functional imperatives of the world that we've lived in for so long, we've got to instill um, this, this whole shaky bridge concept into our planning. 
And so, you know, important strategies, you know, get leadership, get board members, you know, listen to this presentation. And I've done this presentation probably 20 times a year and I would continue to do it just because I think it, it, the more we talk about this and get these concepts out, it's going to help, especially our board members. Um, start to think about this bridge strategy as part of your strategic plan. How are we gonna get across this? How are we gonna address, uh, you know, most strategic plans that, 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 that we see they're very light on the fact that the payment system is going to change. It's almost, that's a constant. And then we just, you know, it's, it's kind of like our old strategic plans with just new information. It doesn't, they don't factor in a payment system that is going to flip the functional imperatives upside down. So start thinking about that. We got to always think about improving operational efficiencies and, you know, uh, you know, being able to compete on quality that we talked about align partner with that medical staff. Think about that, that interdependent alignment of function governance and contracts. And then start thinking about, uh, you know, the developing a, a, a larger regional system and then move forward, um, uh, you, know, you know, proactively move, pick up and move payment. And so I always like to conclude this um, talk is that as an accountant by training, um, I, I feel that it's been the payment system, the fee for service payment system that we've been so wed to um, over the last 50 years is what's keeping us from truly unleashing the force of a $3.5 trillion industry on truly creating healthcare remind, while maintaining access to high quality sick care. I picture a world someday in which we have as much incentive to create community health as we do to provide access to high quality sick care. And if we can proactively move the payment system and come up with strategies within our rural systems to drive that, I believe we can fundamentally change healthcare forever. So I appreciate you all listening. Thanks for your time today. Um, have a great rest of your day and, 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 and let's all stay safe as the, um, as, as the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel is, is coming. So thank you.